Square and welcoming you to Ross Aid Stadium. Live from Ross Aid Stadium in West Lafayette, Indiana. It's a football Saturday in West Lafayette, Indiana, and one of the biggest home games in decades. Where the Lakers rush the field. What a night in West Lafayette. Your Central Indiana Ford dealers are a proud sponsor of Purdue Football and the Raw Sage Greatest Games podcast. Visit your local Central Indiana Ford dealer today. Welcome back to the Raw Sage Greatest Game podcast. Corey Palm with Tim Newton as we celebrate the 100th year of the home of the Boilermakers by uh, going through some of the greatest games ever played in the stadium. A few notes, as always, before we get started. Not a comprehensive list. We're trying to cover as much ground as we can, Tim, but uh, we can't simply don't have enough time to get to all the great games that have been played uh, in Raw Sade. Also, we're just presenting these as, as chronologically, not uh, as rank ordered. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be too difficult and too many arguments would ensue. We don't. We want this nice set to stay to stay not flipped over from anger. We want to start discussions, not arguments. So your results may vary, but we hope you enjoy the ride anyway. Absolutely. Today, we're going back to November 20th, 2004. The battle for the old oaken bucket, well, it wasn't much of a battle, but we'll get to that. Tim, uh, the greatest games in Ross State history aren't always great games. Sometimes they're just historically relevant. That's that's where this one falls. Well, and two big pieces of history in this one. You had Purdue beating Indiana 63-24, 763 yards of total offense, which was a school record. And Taylor Stubblefield during that game caught his 301st pass which broke the NCAA career catches record. Yeah, it was it was amazing and we'll talk uh, we'll talk with Taylor later in the show. He's our guest today. Uh, some some great stories from that time and and hear exactly what it was the 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 play call and the and the catch that broke the record. Not uh, fancy. Not, not fancy, fancy play. Not fancy, not not well thrown either. Uh, he didn't throw his quarterback under the bus, but uh, but we may have. Um before we get to the game, the details of the game, Tim, uh, it's hard to ignore, much as Purdue fans would like to at times, the 2004 season, uh, it was a roller coaster. It was the highest of highs and, and the lowest of lows, and they kind of the Boilermakers experienced it all. It started off really well. Uh, Purdue got off to a great start in the season. If uh, everybody remembers, they were undefeated with uh, Wisconsin coming in here for a game day uh, contest, and I'll just say the words of the fumble, that's all, and, and that started a four-game skid. When Purdue lost four games by what a total of ten points, ten points total, uh, and then rallied at the end of the season and and came back and beat Indiana for the old Oaken bucket, but then went and lost their bowl game. Yeah. So uh, you finished the season with seven and five on a season that started ranked or at one point was ranked in the top five nationally and maybe a chance to move up, but uh, a lot of highs and certainly the game against Indiana was one of those highs for sure, for sure. And and there's there's some discussion. There can be some debate about the greatest teams of the Tiller era. This one was, was certainly in the conversation for half of the season. And, and um, then those four games happened, some injuries happened, yeah. some 45-mile-an-hour uh, wins in Evanston happened. Um, that, I still remember in that Evanston, that get Northwestern game, watching the garbage below us in a like a tornado-like <laughs> swirl for three straight hours. It was a bizarre day and a bizarre game. Northwestern, I believe, scored on their first drive and scored on their last drive and did nothing in between. That was that was enough. That was also the game I think Kyle Owen got nicked up a little yeah. bit. He ended up missing the Iowa game, which we, we fell. That one broke his heart because it was close to home. Right. Didn't get a chance to play the Hawkeyes one more time. Um, anyway, the Boilermakers rebounded a little bit with a late win against Ohio State, and then, like you said, uh, exercised a lot of demons in this bucket battle. Uh, Purdue was really in control from the first quarter on. It, it didn't take long to establish this game. The numbers are eye-popping. You look, Kyle Orton, 33 of 54, 522 yards, six touchdowns. I mean, he had, uh, I think, 400 yards of passing or close to it in the first half alone. And if you go back and watch the film, and you'll see some of the video here, um, Guys were wide open. I mean, it was like Indiana wasn't even on the field. It, it was it was amazing. The, the defense took the field first, forced the three and out. Uh, Kyle drove the Boilermakers 86 yards in just over a minute to to get him on the on the board. A 52 yard touchdown pass to Kyle Ingram, um, all six foot nine inch Kyle. Ingram. Huge day that day for Kyle too. It was. It was. Kyle ended up with 11 receptions, 209 yards. And uh, two scores, one of three receivers to to break the century mark, yeah. which is kind of amazing in itself, uh, and also not the first time that's happened at Purdue, which is also amazing in itself with the prolific offenses. But 
21-3 after one. It was 42-10 to at the half. Five passing touchdowns, like you said, 400 yards in the first half. It could have been worse. Yes. The starters sat for most of the fourth quarter. Well, you mentioned it was 42-10 at halftime. The only Indiana touchdown came on a fumble recovery. Kyle Orton, for one of the few times that day, got hit, and Indiana scooped up a fumble and went about 70 yards for a score. They didn't get in the uh, end zone with the offense all the entire first half, and Purdue... Uh, yeah, they could have really seven sixty three was the was the floor. The, the ceiling could have been a lot higher that day. It could have. And Brandon Kears came in and threw for sixty two yards and and a long touchdown pass. Um, it, it, phenomenal day. That was my first year here at Purdue. I remember that day being in the and and, and it was very clear who was going to win. Um, a lot of times you'll hear somebody say the score didn't indicate how close the game was. I think the score indicated how much of a blowout this was. Yeah, um, you know, we're going to be talking with Taylor Stubblefield in the next segment. Certainly we could have talked to Rob Ninkovich about this game because he spent more time in the backfield than Indiana's running backs. Nine tackles on the day, including four sacks, and he was absolutely unstoppable that afternoon. He was amazing. Uh, he he paced the defense. He he had an entire career in just the two bucket games he played in. I think he had eight and a half sacks in two games against Indiana in his career as a JUCO transfer. Um, it, it, he was amazing. Uh, the defense did its job. Um, the, like we said, the offense, Stubblefield led the team with 14 receptions for 138 and three scores. Dorian Bryant also broke the century mark. Yeah. That, that young man who went on to a great career himself. Yeah. Five receptions, 131 in a touchdown. He also had a 62-yard rush for a score in the game. It, it was coming from all angles. And the win also clinched a, a, a trophy sweep for the second straight year. Purdue had beaten Indiana, uh, Notre Dame, and Illinois to get all three trophies in 2003, did the same thing again in 2004. It was it was truly a, a, a very dominant era. Um, that was the the heart of the Tiller eras. The Tiller the Tiller time frame is is often remembered as the Rose Bowl season. Mm -hmm. I think a great case could be made that 03 might have been his best team here. It was certainly his best defensive team. Definitely so you look at the, that side of the ball, and I think everybody remembers with Joe Tiller, the basketball and grass, and certainly yep. we've talked about some of the great offensive performances. You start looking, though, at some of the defensive players here, 2001, 2, 3, 4. A lot of those guys wound up playing Sundays for a lot of seasons in the NFL. They did indeed, and, and that's kind of – that's one – often forgotten about storyline of this 04 season is as hot as Purdue started, there were a lot of question marks coming in because there were seven players drafted, I believe, yeah. the previous spring, uh, which is the most for in program history, largely because of the defense. There were, you know, there were a lot of youngsters on that, on that 04 defense, but uh, nobody quite knew what it was going to be coming into the year. They, they found out very quickly and, and with this bucket win, it wrapped up like it should have. The defense did its job, and Kyle Orton, who at one point in the season was the Heisman Trophy front runner until that four-game skid, uh, Kyle had a great year, finished it with a great bucket performance, and, uh, and again went on to have his own NFL career. He did indeed. Uh, one one fellow who didn't have an NFL career for a handful of reasons is Taylor Stubblefield. Um, he did end up with the uh, the NCAA record. He set it in the first quarter. He was by no means done. The record-setting catch was his 301st. Right. He ended his career a game and a half later with 325 receptions. That record stood for seven years, which in the modern era, that's sure. that's an eternity yeah. for a record like that. And, you know, people talk about program uh, running a, a system, system guys. Well, somebody's got to catch the ball. Yeah. You know, if it was that easy, everybody would run a system, everybody would put up those numbers. and. Taylor had a unique knack. He wasn't the greatest athlete. He certainly wasn't a big guy, and he wasn't super fast, but he ran precise routes. He could catch the football, and he was p tough. He took a lot of hits. Uh, he was a guy on third and four. You knew if you got the ball to Taylor and got it anywhere near him, he was going to catch it. And so um, the system certainly helped him, but Taylor Stubblefield made a lot of, of what he had. He maximized the potential that he had. And wound up having a sensational college career. He was an All American that season. He was an All and deservedly so. And uh, I believe he's on the ballot for the College Football yeah. Hall of Fame this yes. this season or this summer. And and it would be just. Yeah. It would be appropriate for him to be the Boilermakers' uh, next College Football Hall of Famer. We can hope that happens. Um, 
en- enough talking about the man. Let's talk to the man. Ta- uh, Taylor Stubblefield joins us after the break. Your Central Indiana Ford dealers are a proud sponsor of Purdue football. Visit your local Central Indiana Ford dealer today. We're joined now by Taylor Stubblefield, uh, one of the all-time great wide receivers in college football history, much less uh, for the Boilermakers. Uh, T-Stubbs, thanks for uh, for taking some time with us here today. I appreciate you guys inviting me to do stuff like this. Well, we're going to talk about your career in general, but we want to start specifically with this game, the bucket game in 2004. A 63-24 win and a memorable day for you because it was a day that you set the NCAA a career record for most receptions. What do you remember about that specific play and about that day in general? Uh, the old Oak and Bucket game is is always a special game. Um, you got big bragging rights for for in state. It's a Big Ten game, a Big Ten opponent, um, and for whatever reason, you want that bucket at your home and putting another uh, chain on there was, it was a big priority for us. It's something that we talked about that coach Tiller talked about um, at the beginning of the year in terms of some of our goals. Uh, so to be able to get a win at the end of the season, going into bowl season, it just makes those practices between the end of the season and uh, uh, the bowl game. It makes those practices a little bit more enjoyable for the players. Um, I know in terms now, being on the coaching side, in terms of recruiting, I know going out on the road, going into high schools, trying to get guys to um, to come to your school, it's it's easier to, to talk about the last game. And then, um, to put it very bluntly, we, we whooped him. I mean, we whooped him from the, from the very beginning of, uh, I think I think I had I, I think I had three touchdowns that game, maybe two touchdowns. You, I no, you had three. You had three. Okay, I had three of them. Um, I, I I know that that catch, it was a simple, our simple good old ninety-seven, which was number one receiver outside of me has a go route. Uh, I have just some good old boring out route. It was one of the few times that kind of didn't quite throw an accurate ball. He had to throw you. Uh, yeah, it was down by my feet, so my foot caught it first, and then my foot didn't want to get all the credit for the the reception, so I kicked it up to my hands, allowed my hands to keep up for it. So it was fun. It was cool. They stopped the game, kind of gave me the ball. The referees kind of knew what was going on. So um, it it was a cool day for sure. I always thought it was it was fitting that uh, of all the spectacular plays that you made in your career, that the record setting catch was just a boring out route that that your quarterback underthrew a little bit for seven yards. You know, as, as, as much as I wish it was like some double move, triple coverage, I really maw somebody. Nah, it was a, it was a good old, good old out route underthrown. So, but don't get me wrong. Like there's a lot of work that goes into the, those, uh, to all of those, the, those catches from the protection to the running back having an ID, whether it's front side, back side, whether he's having a scan, guys doing the, the right thing. Like one thing that gets under um, undervalued is the outside receiver. He has to mandatory outside release so I don't get blasted or an interception. So um, there's still a lot that goes into that boring catch. Taylor, you had 763 yards of total offense in that game, which set a Purdue record. Going into that week, did you feel like you were going to have a big day against that IU defense? Uh, you know what? Um, I think that year was such a roller coaster year, right? We start out on fire, boy. I mean, there were, all these teams came in. We played, I think, Syracuse, uh, Ball State, um, Notre Dame, Illinois. The, the, these guys – these other defenses thought that we were just going to be an average, average offense, no offensive line. We knew we had a good quarterback. The receiver, John Stanford, had left, and and, and it was like, man, who else is there? And um, we had chances, and we, had, uh, we showed at times that we could be flat-out explosive. Um, and that's where we were that day. Things clicked. 
the play call and Coach Tiller and their, that whole staff, they put a great game plan together. Our defense with Coach Spack, it was always steady, Eddie, bend, don't break. Um, and we put some together. But like I said, I, I mean, lack of better word, we, we whooped their <laughs> tail. Yeah, I, I was telling Tim earlier, it felt like, uh, you know, a lot of frustrations might have been taken out that day, like you said, with sort of the way the season had gone. Um, you know, start off 110 points in your first two games is unbelievable. Um, and, and then to lose the four that, that we lost by a total of 10 points is also unbelievable. It had to be, it had to feel so nice to get back on track and, and have everything click that day. It did. It did. And once again, just the, the, the bucket game, in-state rivalry, um, it, it felt really good to end that way. By the way, we should mention that Taylor, this is not a background, a fake background behind him. As a college football coach, now he savors his days in the summer when he's not out recruiting and not out coaching. So you're on your way to the golf course right now, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna, you know what? I'm going to try not to yell four more than once. Um, I'm going to try to get Try to get my foot wedge uh, in my bag and uh, and see if I can't hit the fairway. I'm sure you'll hit them far and, and uh, straight today. Um, the system we talk all the time about the basketball on grass. How did that system fit Taylor Stubblefield? It it fit one because I didn't have to block all that well. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, um, you know, coming uh, coming from. Um, Michigan State, I know that some of the games that you probably saw in, in college, they, they were eye formation, hand that ball off. The receivers got to go in there and uh, block a, a linebackers, tons of safeties, and then maybe get a play-action pass. I think what Coach Tiller and that staff did is they realized that we weren't always going to get the top-rated, most athletic recruits. Because, I mean, I was um, – I mean – I was not, definitely not on a lot of people's uh, uh, board in terms of recruiting. And so they were able to get players that fit their system. Uh, we were, they were ahead of their times in terms of uh, RPOs or relief throws. Um, they were able to create an offense that allowed us not to block everybody and to take advantage of leverage um, and to flip it out there. Um, to flip it out there, to make some easy throws, easy completions. And if you remember guy, I mean, I know we remember guys like Vinny Sutherland, who he did it better than anybody. He took a bubble screen and he could take that, you know, to the house in a heartbeat. I was lucky to get maybe two first downs on that same bubble screen. Um, but that's just, uh, that's just what the offense was. It was, it, it also got, it gave a lot of freedom to the quarterback. I think that uh, Greg Olson, Jim Chaney did a great job in the position meetings of literally allowing what they saw in terms of the, the scheme show up in Drew's eyes and Kyle's eyes so that they could see and make adjustments on the fly when need be. And, you know, people will talk about the, the, um, the Notre Dame catch, uh, the Notre Dame play for, you know, those yards. That play was not called. Uh, that was a play that was checked uh, from Kyle and myself because they believed in 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 what they in the preparation that they put into the week in terms of position meetings. That was kind of a dangerous uh, a dangerous choice that you and Kyle made. As I recall, it was third and long. You were you know backed way up. I mean, of course, you you knew what you were doing, and uh, it paid off in a big big way. That had to be the best fifteen yard penalty of your career, right? For sure. I mean, I, I, the only thing I, you know, uh, Coach Tiller made me feel real guilty, right? Because he came, I came off the field, and he goes, "Listen, I don't feel bad at all for you getting that penalty. I don't, not one bit. But what I did is, after I got into the end zone, you can see uh, on some of the TV copies, I went to the camera, and I kind of stared into the camera, kind of like, "Hey, look at me," and. um if there's one thing I would take back is what I did after I scored, not during during the 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 um the catch, but uh yeah that that was I mean that was awesome absolutely awesome it felt like it was um it was slowed down it was like the Matrix I was running <laughs> I know some people thought I know some people thought if it was like 15 yards longer I was gonna get caught <laughs> but it, but it was it was a great time 
I have to ask you now, as Coach Stubblefield, if one of your players did that, what would your reaction be coming off the field? Coach Stubblefield would would um, definitely use some motivating words to make sure that that doesn't happen again because now that penalty would be wherever that penalty was, was called, it's 15 yards from that spot, so the, the touchdown would not count. So completely different outcome. And, um, yeah, I would, I would, um, for sure let that, uh, player know in a motivating way. Of course. <laughs> Speaking of as coach Stubblefield, you just mentioned coach Tiller, uh, now that you are a few years older and seeing the game from a different perspective, how do you view coach Tiller differently than you did when you were 20, 19, 20, 21 year old player? Great question. And, and, uh, you know, I might have to think about that one for a little bit, but what, what, um, my dad was a high school coach. He was a basketball coach, a football coach. I learned from a very young age about when a coach speaks, you listen. And, and when he was coaching basketball, when he started speaking, I made sure me and my brother, we picked up the ball. Everybody had attention, um, to the coach. So with coach Tiller, and really the whole staff, but specifically Coach Tiller, you couldn't necessarily joke with him very often until later on in your career. When he spoke, you listened. And a lot of times what he said, you may not have understood at that particular time, but as you either got older or maybe 30 minutes, uh, 30 minutes later or maybe seven days later, you realize this is what he's talking about. This makes sense. And and he just had words that were backed up by actions that just made you believe in everything that he said. And so he was more, for sure, more of a, um, a grandfather figure um, in terms of just, like, you knew not to cross him. Um, and you believed in what he said. And every now and again, he put his arm around you and lift you up. So, um, ton, tons of respect for how coach Tiller was as a coach. And in some regards, um, I, I've, I've had to change my coaching style a little bit now because, um, it's different now. It's a lot different now, but especially early on his black and white approach and, and, and the do right rule. Everybody talks about the do, do right rule. Um, I, I lived by that um, religiously early on in my career. Now, I guess you can say I put some gray area in there. Uh, but, but coach Tiller was truly a legend. Was coaching. Did you think coaching was in your future when you were here? I did actually when, when I don't know if you guys remember when I hurt my head and I missed those, um, three games. Um, I think it was after it was going into my junior year and Ted Gilmore, uh, no, it was going to my sophomore, te technically my third year going into, uh, yeah, going into my third year being at, at Purdue, uh, I had hurt my head and, uh, Ted Gilmore, who's now at Michigan state, um, he gave me a lot of freedom and, and gave me a lot of responsibility in terms of coaching the younger guys. And so right then and there. I was like, I'm either going to go into business or I'm going to be a coach. I tried the business world for a little bit, didn't have enough competitive bite to it. And so um, I decided I wanted to try this coaching thing. Well, it's working out. Uh, like you said, you're you're at the Air Force Academy. Um, mm -hmm. A second stint there. What What is it about uh, Colorado Springs that they drew you back? The, to be honest, the, how genuine the staff is. I could have sat out this year. I could have gone to a, a, a couple different other places. Uh, but Coach Calhoun, Mike Thiessen, Steve Lebotsky, Jake Campbell, some of those guys that have been there, that were there before on my previous stop, and some of them who had been there uh, when I was at Wake Forest um, University, those guys are just true. They're genuine the quality of the people that, that we are around, the quality of the kids. And another reason is we win a lot of games. Um, yeah. uh, if you look at what Coach Calhoun has done the last, it, for 
not even talking about his whole career, but even just most recently in those last four years. I mean, he's beaten some teams that have been in the playoff the year before, um, come from major conferences that are supposed to have the advantage and put a game plan together offensively, defensively with Coach Knorr, with what they're doing on the defense side of the ball, being the number one defense in the country. It's, um, it's a real treat to be back here at the Air Force Academy. We don't want you to miss your tea time, so just one more question. When you think back on your time at Purdue, what, what stands out? What are the memories that you took away from West Lafayette back to the West Coast? You know what? The people. Um, I take away the people that were not just in the football department. Uh, some of my teachers, some of the people in the media, um, sports communication people that still reach out to me, um, Tanya Foster, some of the academic uh, um, um, counselors. That's what I... That, that's probably what I take away the most that for me, I truly felt that people cared about us uh, more than just how many touchdowns we, we would score. Um, and then it, 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 another thing I do remember too, is we used to pack that thing out. Um, I mean, those were some years where it was hard to get a ticket to come to, to a Purdue game. And, it wasn't, you know, we couldn't have the night games back then. Or we had a couple, but we had to bring the lights in. Uh, but now the guys got the lights in there. That that that's a pretty sweet place. I know when we played there last last year when I was at um, that other school, um, it was a it, it, it was a great environment. It really was. They 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 had it rocking. The all black, the blacked out. That that was sweet. That was smooth. Seeing Drew Brees on the sideline. Uh, Benny Smith on the sideline. That, those are some cool guys to see and just seeing the atmosphere. It kind of felt like it was back in uh, in those good old days. Well, it, it, it's great to have you back last year. Glad you're not going to be on the opposing sideline uh, uh, anytime soon. Uh, the, 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 that's easier for us as Purdue fans to, to not have to cheer against you, for sure. Uh, yeah. Taylor, thank you so much for your time and, and for uh, for this trip down memory lane. I really appreciate it.